Hello, today we're doing part two of Mary at the Crossroads of History. And you can, we'll be following, we'll be doing chapters two through four. So we'll start out by um, praying together. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Come Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, I believe that in order to be able to really appreciate this book by Father Francis Hoffman, which is such a beautiful book about the history of Mary's intervention over time and how many times she's really stepped into history in a dramatic way. I think we really need to talk first of all about the Annunciation and how it is that Mary has the title Mother of God and um, the whole background of that. I think it's important to go over. So let's look at Luke chapter one verses 26 to 38, the account of the Annunciation. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now the sixth month refers to Mary's cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy that Elizabeth was an, an elderly woman who had miraculously conceived St. John the Baptist, miraculous because she was so old and she was barren. But the angel Gabriel told Mary that she had conceived as, as a way of reassuring our blessed mother that all things are possible with God. And the angel Gabriel had made the announcement to, to Zach, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, while he was offering incense in the temple, he was a priest, that, that he would have a son, that Elizabeth, his wife, would conceive and bear a son, and that he was to name him John. And Zechariah didn't believe the angel Gabriel, and he said, how shall I know this since, since my wife is old and I'm an old man? And um, Gabriel said, I'm Gabriel who stand in the presence of God. And because you haven't believed my words, you will be unable to speak until the day when they come to pass. And that's what happened during, during the whole pregnancy of his wife, Elizabeth, Zechariah was mute and unable to speak. And he couldn't speak until the day of John's circumcision, when he was eight days old, the baby John, and Zechariah wrote on a tablet, John is his name. And as soon as he wrote that, he could speak. And then he began to praise God and he gave us the beautiful Benedictus prayer, which is part of the church's morning prayer every single morning, the prayer that Zechariah said in praise of God, blessed be the God, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. So Nazareth, Nazareth was a small town that wasn't really highly regarded by people, which we know because um, the apostle Nathaniel, when he was called by Philip and was told about Jesus, he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So he was kind of surprised that the Messiah would come from the town of Nazareth. So the angel Gabriel at the Annunciation was sent to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. So we know that betrothed meant married. Okay, so that it was a, a two-step process that um, marriage in those days where the marriage would take place at the betrothal, but then the husband and wife would not live together until after a certain amount of time had gone by. So this was the interim time right now when the Annunciation occurred. Because Joseph was descended from King David and was the legal father of Jesus, although not the biological father, we, Jesus was legally a son of David, but we believe that Mary also was descended from David. But there's also evidence in scripture that she descended from Aaron as well. Aaron was um, the, of the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. And the reason we know that is because um, Elizabeth was her relative and Elizabeth was of um, descended from Aaron. And the angel came to her and said, hail full of grace, the Lord is with you. 
So it's beautiful to think of that when every time we pray the Hail Mary, we're renewing, St. Louis de Montfort said, we renew in Our Lady's heart the joy of that moment when the angel Gabriel came and greeted her, hail full of grace. And what is grace? Grace is the life of God in our soul. I like, when I pray the Hail Mary, I like to think of the Holy Spirit when I say full of grace, because it's the Holy Spirit who's the author of our sanctification. And then the Lord is with thee. I think of God, the father, and then blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. So the whole Trinity is being honored in the prayer, the Hail Mary, which we know comes, the beginning of the Hail Mary comes directly out of Luke chapter one. So the expression which Jerome translated as full of grace in Greek is kikaritomene. This Greek word has a connotation of having already been filled and continually to be filled with grace. So St. Pius X, when he defined Mary's immaculate conception, which means when he, he clarified that it was part of the church's doctrine, that was in 1854, um, he referred to this expression as indicating that Mary was sinless from the first moment of her conception, that she was prepared by God from all eternity when he, it was always in the mind of God that this woman would be the immaculate, that this woman would be the mother of God. And so when he created her soul, he didn't allow it to be infected with original sin. All of us, when we were conceived in our mother's womb, at the moment God created our soul and infused it into our body, we also contracted original sin, which is the sin of our first parents that we inherit. It's not a sin that we commit, it's a sin that we inherit. But, but he made an exception when he created his mother because um, she needed to be the perfect vessel to receive God into her womb. So it was a grace that was applied backwards in time, a grace that was earned by Jesus by his death on the cross, but was applied backwards in time. And it's beautiful to think of that thought because God is outside of time. And the beautiful thing that we can think of is we can always pray for the happy death of another person who has already died because God who's outside of time and knows the future can see us in the future praying a prayer for the person at the moment of, of their death. And he can apply that, that prayer to the moment of the person's death. So we should never give up on any person. We should always pray for those, those people we love. I mean, we should pray for all people. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered what sort of greeting this might be. So it's unusual for an, for an angel to address a person by a title uh, it seems like the only other occurrence of this in the scripture was when in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, when the angel addresses Gideon and kind of maybe even sarcastically as you mighty man of valor, because he wasn't really that brave a man. I mean, if it, it's a little bit funny. God, there's a lot of humor in the Bible, and I think that's part of God's sense of humor there to call him the mighty man of val valor. So Our Lady, despite her exalted holiness, was extremely humble, and it didn't fit with her opinion of herself, you know, to be greeted by one of God's messengers with such a high title. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God or found grace with God. It parallels an expression in Genesis 6, 8 that Noah found grace with God or favor with God at the time when all the rest of the earth had descended into, um, into sin to such a degree that God sent the flood that, that destroyed uh, the, all the humans on the earth and all the, um, all the land animals with the exception of Noah and his wife and, his, and Noah's three sons and their wives and the animals that were brought into the ark. So it was like a renewal. And it was foreshadowing, it was foreshadowing baptism, the renewal that comes to our souls through baptism. So, and it's interesting also to note um, that the Ark of the Covenant in, in um, the time when the Israelites were in the desert and God told them to build an ark and um, not, not the same kind of ark that, that Noah built obviously, but, but a, something that would parallel our modern day tabernacle and, and into the ark, they were to put the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And that was the presence of God for them in, um, during the time that they journeyed in the desert. 
And they also had some manna that was preserved in the ark. Manna was the miraculous bread that God fed his people with for the 40 years they were in the desert. But when Mary said yes to the angel at the Annunciation, she became the new Ark of the Covenant. So she became the one who carries the bread of life, Jesus Christ, in her own, in her own body. So she's the new Ark of the Covenant. And I think it's important that we see the parallel between Noah's Ark and Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, because in Noah's time, the Ark was opened for several days. So Presumably, people could have entered into the ark and, um, and asked for refuge in the ark, but they probably were just making fun of Noah, you know, for building this huge, this huge boat on dry land, you know. It probably seemed very odd to them. I'm sure it did. But now in our time, you know, we're being invited by Our Lady um, all through, um, throughout, especially throughout recent centuries, like at Fatima, um, Lourdes, and many of the places where she's been appearing, invited invited by Our Lady to consecrate ourselves to her Immaculate Heart, like enter into her capacity for God, which is the, the, the capacity of God in Mary is enough for the whole human race. It's like, it's, it's like the storeroom where God puts all his treasure. And so we're invited to enter into that capacity of our Blessed Mother and to be protected there from the devil, because the devil has absolutely no control over our Blessed Mother. In fact, we know that it's through Our Lady that Jesus comes into the world and that Jesus is the one who destroys the power of sin and death by his crucifixion and resurrection. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus is a Hebrew name meaning God saves. So Jesus, like St. John the Baptist, was named before he was conceived. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. So Mary knew that that, that could only refer to the long-awaited Messiah. And Isaiah had prophesied 700 years earlier that when the Messiah came, he would be born of a virgin and that he would be called Emmanuel a name which means God with us. And so the Jewish people knew that when the Messiah came, he would be God. It was prophesied that God himself was going to enter into his own creation. So what happened at the Annunciation when Mary said, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. At that moment, the word became flesh. And what that means is, Jesus, who's the second person of the Trinity, he's the son, the eternal son of the father. He took on another nature. He took on a human nature and he became man. And he's still one person. He's the second divine person. But now he has two natures. He has the nature of God, which he's always had since he has no beginning as God. But now he also has the nature of man since the moment of the incarnation, since the moment Mary said yes to God's plan. Mary became the new Eve at that moment, reversing the destruction that the first Eve brought into the world by disobeying God's commandment. So David's throne refers to the promise God made to King David. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His line shall endure forever his throne as long as the sun before me. And so King David lived about 1000 BC. So, so down through all that time, there had been a descendant of David and Joseph, as we know from the genealogy of Matthew, descends from David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. So the house of Jacob refers to the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember that Abraham, we call Abraham our father in faith because Abraham the patriarch was called by God to leave his own country and to go to the land that the Lord would show him. And later on, after Abraham had waited for many, many years for God to fulfill his promise, um, his wife Sarah gave birth to Isaac. Then Isaac later gave birth to Jacob and Jacob gave birth to 12 sons, I mean, Jacob's wives gave birth to 12 sons. And those 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel descend from those 
12 sons. Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. So, so the 12 tribes were um, scattered because of their idolatry. I mean, for, for many centuries, they, they lived in the land of Israel, but then they were exiled, the Northern tribes, the 10 Northern tribes, which had separated after the death of Solomon, uh, the 10 tribes in the North known as Israel and the two tribes in the South known as Judah, Judah and Benjamin, uh, they had separated and become like two separate kingdoms. But then um, the, the Northern tribes were exiled to Assyria and after that, um, about a century later, around 586 BC, the Southern tribes were exiled to Babylon, but the two Southern tribes were able to come back under the reign of Cyrus, King of Persia. And so some of them came back and rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, but the 10 Northern tribes were scattered and um, intermingled with the peoples to the point where they could no longer be really um, separately identified so that so they, they were waiting for the Messiah to come and reunite the 12 tribes of Israel. The kingdom of God, which Christ came to establish has no end. And that doesn't just mean chronologically, it's not limited in any way, the kingdom of God. So then comes this very important question that's um, really important to understand what is being asked here and also what is being implied. And Mary said to the angel, how shall this happen since I do not know man? And what that means is it's, it's an indication that Mary, who's already legally married to Joseph, that Mary and Joseph have made an agreement that they are not going to have sexual relations in their marriage, which typically would not be God's plan for a marriage. But in this particular marriage, it is his plan because these two are chosen to be the guardians of the word of God. And so she's asking, how can I how can I give birth to a child if I'm gonna remain a virgin? That's what the question means. And so then um, that's really important to understand because a lot of people misinterpret that question. But, but if you think about it, it doesn't even make sense if, if she's already legally married to Joseph, then why would she wonder how she was going to conceive a child unless she had already made, they had already made a vow that they would live as virgins. And it, it it fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that had been made 700 years before. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and his name shall be called Emmanuel. And so the angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. So here's another key verse for our understanding the teaching of our faith that we pray in the Nicene Creed, incarnate of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus Christ is truly the son of the father. He's, got, he's conceived by God. He's not conceived by Joseph. He's conceived by God in the womb of the Virgin Mother Mary. And she's ever virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ. And Greek, the expression used for overshadow is the same one that is used in the Greek version of Exodus 40, 35 to describe how God overshadowed the tabernacle, the place of his dwelling. So the Shekinah, the glory cloud is very, um, very key way of understanding God's action, God's way of conceiving Christ, of bringing Christ into the world through the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. And it refers back to the first creation where in the second chapter of the Bible we read, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the face of the water. So, so the spirit of God bringing forth um, order out of the chaos when, when God brought everything into being out of nothing. And then the new creation when now the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary to begin the new creation and, and to conceive Christ in her womb. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age also has conceived a, a son. This is the sixth month with her who is called barren for with God, nothing will be impossible. So by giving her this news about Elizabeth, the angel Gabriel is reassuring Mary that God can do all things. Just as he is allowing this elderly barren woman to conceive, then he can make a virgin conceive also. 
And in the background of this picture by Fra Angelica, you can see Adam and Eve um, being exiled from the Garden of Eden with the, um, the angel um, leading them out of the Garden of Eden. So it's, par I mean, it's showing the, um, how God is reversing that exile now by sending the Archangel Gabriel to, to, to announce to the new Eve that she has been chosen to give birth to the Messiah. And we know Jesus is the new Adam. So when Mary said, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word, everything changed, everything changed. So this is like the reversal of original sin, the beginning of the redemption of the world when, when our blessed mother says yes, because it was a woman who began original sin in God's providence, it's a woman who begins the redemption. Um, Eve by her disobedience and Mary by her obedience. Mary reverses um, the, the damage that Eve brought into the world of sin and death and suffering. And so we know that eventually, um, like at Fatima, Mary said, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. And we have to always keep that in mind because no matter what type of suffering we're going through, God has a perfect plan. And he's going to bring it to fulfillment, no matter what, how much evil there is in the world, love is always stronger and his God is all powerful. He wouldn't allow evil to exist in the world if he couldn't bring a greater good out of it somehow. <clears throat> and, it, and so um, Father Francis Hoffman talks about how Our Lady, the last time she's mentioned in the New Testament is in in John, mentioned by name rather, um, in John, is in uh, John chapter 19, where, no, the Pent actually it's in Acts chapter two, when um, at Pentecost, when she's present, when the Holy Spirit comes down on the whole church and, and the church is born, again, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary first and then throughout from her throughout the whole church, forming the body of Christ. But she's mentioned again in the book of Revelation, Okay, and this is um, Revelation chapter 12, actually beginning at the end of chapter 11, where St. John sees heaven opened and the Ark of God's Covenant. And immediately after that verse, we see these verses. So indicating that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. And a great sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and upon her had a crown of 12 stars. Being with child, she cried out in her travail, and was in the anguish of delivery. And so um, this is Mary as mother of the church. It's, it's also representing the, the church herself, the whole Catholic church, but it, it's representing Mary in travail with the body of Christ. And another sign was seen in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his head, seven diadems. And his tail was dragging along the third part of the stars of heaven and it dashed them to the earth. So this is the battle, the ongoing battle of, of um, between good and evil that's being indicated in um, Revelation chapter 12. And it's thought to be a description of the fall of the angels that occurred before Adam and Eve were even created. God created all the angels first but before he allowed them to see his face, which is what we call the beatific vision, which is the fullness of heavenly glory, before he did that, he tested them. And we believe the test was showing them the woman clothed with the sun, the pregnant woman clothed with the sun, because that was his indication to the angels that he intended to become incarnate, that God intended to become a man, to be born of a woman. And so for Lucifer, who was the high, probably the highest of the angels, the most beautiful of the angels at the time, um, he was too proud. He said, I will not serve. I won't bow down to the God man because, because people were of such of a lower nature than angels. And I mean, we still are. I mean, we're, we're much lower in intellect and also in other types of powers than the angels are. But but because of Jesus, we've been raised above the angels, but, but that's a whole other level of discussion. So, so it says here that the dragon, he became a dragon. Now, I, obviously this is not literal because angels don't have bodies. Angels are pure spirits. And so they don't, they're not physical in other words, 
but but the image of the seven heads and ten horns so that's an image of the ugliness and um, the dragon and the wickedness and then the, the image of the tail sweeping a third of the stars from heaven the fathers of the church think that means that of every three angels god created one of them one out of every three became a chose to become a devil and um, the other two chose to remain faithful to god which is good news for us because the good angels outnumber the bad two to one okay and also good news for us because our guardian angels were there and our angels said yes to God. And then God admitted the good angels to the fullness of seeing him face to face. And once you see God face to face, you're confirmed in grace. You'll never sin again. That's one of the most beautiful things about heaven is that we can't sin again. We won't be able, to, we'll have no attraction to commit sin in heaven because God is like the most powerful magnet and we're like the most flimsy piece of tinfoil against that, you know? It's just, the fullness of everything we could ever desire when we see God face to face. And that's our angels are already looking at God face to face. Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 18, he says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones for their angels in heaven. Always behold the face of my heavenly father. So your angel who's with you right now, inspiring you to do good is also seeing God face to face at the same time. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to bring forth that when she had brought forth, he might devour her son. She brought forth a male child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And so the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is going to come later on in, um, in our discussion of Mary at the Crossroads of History, a very important image. But you can see in the woman clothed with the sun, you can see scriptural references to the assumption of Mary into heaven and also the crowning of Mary as queen of heaven and earth to the last two glorious mysteries of the rosary. And there was a battle in heaven. Michael and his angels battled with the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels, they did not prevail. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So Michael, um, we believe came up from one of the lower choirs of angels, like there's nine choirs of angels. And, um, and he said, who is like God? That's what the name Michael means, who is like God? Because the angels fight with ideas since they don't have bodies. And so the idea of who is like God um, cast the demons out, the devil, Lucifer, and the, the demons were cast out of heaven because they can't answer that, who is like God. In other words, what Michael meant by that was, you know, God made you out of nothing. So, so why do you think, you know, you're so special that you can't bow down and worship him? I mean, he made you out of nothing. And so in a way, the angels, the good angels kind of laugh, I think, at the devils at this point. So now I'm going to talk about um, what Father Francis Hoffman says in, in the book, Mary at the Crossroads of History, about the heresy of Nestorius. Nestorius was chosen to be the bishop of Constantinople. And... Um, and he was a heretic because he didn't believe that Mary was the mother of God. He said Mary was the mother of Christ, but not the mother of God. And so the, the Council of Ephesus in 431 refuted that heresy and declared that Mary is mother of God. She's the, the Theotokos, the bearer of God. Now, um, because it was such a big dispute, um, and had gone on for many years and um, with much violence, I think even violence involved. I mean, I don't know if there was actual violence involved, but there was a lot of animosity between the two different positions. And so some of the Eastern Christians refused to accept that teaching of the Council of Ephesus. And those Eastern Christians went into schism and they lived in what presently is Syria, Iran and Iraq, that, those parts of the world. And so the point that um, Father Hoffman is making, which I think is a very good point, is um, Mohammed um, supposedly had visions of the Archangel Gabriel that um, told him to found the Muslim religion. And he died in 632. Now um, the Muslim religion, the Quran, which is their holy book, honors Jesus and Mary, but denies that Jesus is God. And so think about the parallels between um, Nestorianism, the heresy of Nestorianism and the, the, the false teaching of, of Mohammedism. 
So many people in the areas of present day Syria, Iran, and Iraq readily accepted Islam because of the influence of the previous heresy of Nestorius that, remember Nestorius said that um, Mary was not the mother of God. So once it's denied that Mary is the mother of God, it becomes easy to deny that Christ is God but our faith is built on the belief that Jesus Christ is God. He's the second person of the Trinity. Otherwise, he could not have redeemed the human race because no human person could, by any form of sacrifice, redeem the whole human race. But Jesus did so because he's a divine person with a, with a human nature, with a perfect human nature. So by 711, the Muslim Caliphate had taken over most of Spain and was threatening all of Europe. So um, the Spanish army had retreated into a very um, mountainous northern part of Spain, and it looked almost hopeless for them because they were so vastly outnumbered and um, they were so really divided among themselves. But then there was a leader of the Spanish army named Paleo, and um, he went to this special cave. There was a special image of Our Lady, and he went to this cave and um, the image, the holy cave of Covadonga in remote mountainous northern Spain. And this is a picture of the actual statue of the miraculous image of Our Lady in Covadonga. And here's um, a picture of, of the cave. So you can see, like, talk about remote. I mean, just think of how hard it must be even to get up there. I'm, I don't know how the people get up there, but um, I mean, they must have a lot of steps to climb. So Our Lady heard the prayer of Paleo. He went and prayed, please help us, Blessed Mother, because we're, over not, we're outnumbered and our whole country is falling um, into, the, into Muslim reign and you need to help us because we can't do anything without your help. And so what happened when the Muslims began to attack, the arrows in midair, all of a sudden the arrows were reversing direction and going back and killing the archers, the Muslim archers. And then came a terrible storm, then a flood, then a landslide. And so all these um, miraculous events led to a Spanish victory. The vastly outnumbered Spanish army was able to defeat this huge army of Muslim invaders and to begin to push them back um, from Northern Spain and to gradually over many centuries to eventually um, reclaim Spain as a Christian country. And, but that was, in 1492 when the Reconquista was finally completed, but, but it began way back in 711 with this prayer that Paleo prayed to Our Lady of Covadonga and um, her answer to the prayer. And so it's, it's beautiful to think of um, Our Lady interceding in that way because what would have happened if, if she hadn't interceded? Because probably all of Europe would have become Muslim. And then who knows if, um, if Columbus would have ever um, sailed with the intention of evangelizing the new world, which is what um, Father Hoffman brings out in a later chapter. So we don't know what would, hap what would have happened, but we thank God that Our Lady stepped into history and that she continues to step into history to help us because she takes very seriously her role given to her by God to be our mother. So let's pray that we'll always have that deep devotion to our Blessed Mother. Thank you very much and God.